Good morning. It is great to see you all here this morning. It's great to be here with you. If you will, open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 10. Uh, actually, Matthew chapter 11. We're going to go back to Matthew chapter 10, hopefully in just a minute. As you're turning your Bibles, um, I want to do something that uh, I can't remember ever having done before, but it is most appropriate today. I was uh, here, had the wonderful privilege of preaching a gospel meeting here back in 2007, eight, uh, eight years ago, and it was a, a great experience. I thoroughly enjoyed being here. You were very encouraging to me, uh, and it, it really did a lot of good for me, but I made a mistake during that meeting. I used a PowerPoint to project an image of a, of a piece of artwork from several hundred years ago, and, uh, and I wish I hadn't done that, and I want you to know that, that I'm sorry that I did that. Uh, I regret it, and I wanted to uh, formally apologize to you. I, start, I wanted to do it during the worship hour this morning when there would be more people here, but that's projected, that's broadcast on radio and television, so I didn't want to do it then, so... So I hope uh, if you know of anybody who would be benefited by that acknowledgement on my part, I hope you'll let them know that or point them out to me and I'll tell them personally uh, that I regret doing that. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Do you find that following Jesus, living for Christ, living the Word of God out in your life, do you think of that as easy. Do you find the restrictions and the responsibilities of Christianity light? Is that a light load to carry? 1 John 5 verse 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. But sometimes... Doesn't it feel a little burdensome? How do I square this feeling of Christianity can be hard, and yet Jesus says it's supposed to be easy? Doing God's will can be difficult, but 1 John says it's not burdensome. Why is my experience not always the same as the description in Scripture. Well, let's back up to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 24. Jesus says, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher, and the slave like his master. You come down to verse 37. He says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he, do, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. He who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Christianity takes practice. But if you notice what Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 10, He says, it is enough for a disciple that he become like his master. You know how many times the word disciple is used in the New Testament? The New American Standard, which is the translation that I normally use, the word disciple or a form of the word disciple is used 272 times. 
You know how many times the word Christian is used in the New Testament? Three. 272 verses 3. One of the reasons that the commandments of God sometimes feel burdensome, or sometimes the reason that the yoke feels difficult, is because we are not becoming like our master. You see, a disciple is supposed to become like his master. And so as we become more and more like Jesus, following after Jesus, following the instructions of Jesus, gets easier and easier and easier. But to the extent that we find our own life, you know, that's what he says in verse 37 through 39, he who has found his life will lose it to the extent that we're finding our own life, that we're building it for ourselves and not patterning it after Jesus, then doing what Jesus says feels burdensome. It feels difficult. And you see, the difference is practice. And you don't really need a lot of practice when it's easy. When you're walking down the street, and a four-year-old comes running up to you crying, and you don't see a parent in sight, it's easy to sit down and to help that child, and to care, and to, to give of yourself. But when somebody insults you, it's not easy to respond with gentleness. When somebody smacks you on the cheek, it's not easy to turn the other one to him. When somebody takes something from you, it's not easy to say, is there anything else you want? Unless you're practicing. The, supreme, the, the three-point king of the NBA, Stephen Curry, set a record last year for three-point uh, three shots made, and I think for three-point percentage. He made the news in the middle of the season because during practice, he made 77 three-point shots in a row. 77 three-point, not foul shots, three-point shots in a row. And one of the things that's so remarkable about that is that most NBA players never shoot a hundred shots in practice. But he does it every day. And he's famous for his practice regime. So you watch him play basketball, you see what he does on the court, and you think, well, he's just naturally gifted. It just comes easy to him. It doesn't come easy. He practices more than anybody else. And he's better at it. And it looks easy because he practices more than anybody else. Christianity is the same way. So we're asking this morning, do you act like Jesus? Do you practice acting like Jesus? I want to run through seven things this morning, seven keys to acting like Jesus, seven things that we need to be doing when we're not under pressure, when it's not the fourth quarter, when everybody's not watching, where we need to be practicing acting like Jesus so that when the pressure is on and things are difficult, it's a lot easier to do what Jesus wants us to do, to follow the Word of God. Number one is prayer. Look with me at Luke chapter 5, verse 16. Luke chapter 5, verse 16 looks like a really innocuous verse. It looks like just a little transitional thing that they tell us that doesn't seem very important. But the more you study the person of who Jesus was, if you, when you study how Jesus structured His life, and if we had more time, I could take you after, through verse after verse that shows this is true. But Luke 5.16 really summarizes it. Luke 5.16 says, But Jesus would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Jesus would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Brothers and sisters, if you're going to act like Jesus, 
you must pray often. You must pray often. You know, a lot of people pray every now and then. And some Christians or people who call themselves Christians and go to church frequently only pray sometimes. But people who are taking up their cross and following after Jesus, a disciple who is becoming like his master, must pray often. I worked with a lawyer one time who called himself an agnostic. He says, I'm not sure if God exists or not. I don't know if there is a God or if there's not a God. And that gave him great freedom. You know, he could do whatever he wanted to do because he didn't know. But when, one day in the middle of the day, he gets a call. And the call says, your dad has been rushed to the hospital. He's in the emergency room right now. We're not sure what's wrong. He comes to another friend, a friend that he knew was a practicing Christian, and he says, I'd like for you to pray for my dad. This man who was proud of his lack of allegiance to God, when he got scared, he prayed. But God doesn't hear the prayer of the unrighteous. Jesus prayed often. You know what he said to us? If you look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, he says, But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you openly. When you pray. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. You see, prayer requires us to acknowledge the power of God. If you have the proper attitude in prayer, and it even helps if you will adopt a submissive position, if you will bow your head, if you will even bow your back, if you would get on your knees... It puts you into a proper posture to show your dependence on God. And prayer is as much about bringing your attitudes and your desires into conformity with God as it is about asking for the power of God to intervene in your life. And prayer should be at least as much about thanksgiving as it is about requests. Probably more. But you see, when you pray, you have to acknowledge that you need help. You have to acknowledge, acknowledge that something else has more power than you do. And that you rely on that power, and that that power necessarily requires you to be in submission. And so when you're praying about things that God doesn't want you to have, and you're praying about submission and obedience... God, help me to do your will. Help me to submit to you. Help me to become more like Jesus. And then you start asking for things and you start remembering reasons that he doesn't want you to have those things and you're faced with the decision. Am I going to follow God or am I going to follow myself? Prayer does that for you. Number two, study. If you look at Luke 4, Verse 16, we looked at Luke 5, 16. You back up a chapter to Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Tells us about Jesus. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Luke 5, 16 says Jesus would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Luke 4, 16 says that Jesus' custom, his habit, was to go to the, to the synagogue on the Sabbath and read. Read the Word of God. If you remember when Jesus was 12 years old and His parents took Him to Jerusalem for the feast, and they're on the way back and they realize He's not with them, and they go back to Jerusalem and they search for Him. He's been gone for three days. 
And they finally find him where? In the temple. And what's he doing? He's talking to the priests and the scribes. He's talking to the teachers of the law and he's asking questions. What is he doing? He's showing an amazing gift for the Word of God, but he's also learning. He's also studying. Even though he is God, he is the Word that became flesh, he is also reading and talking about and learning the Word of God. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15 says, Be diligent to present yourself a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. How often do you handle the word of truth? How often do you use your hands to open and page through the Word of God. Think about your future. Think about something that is going to happen in every one of our lives. Every person who's here this morning, every person alive, every person who has ever been alive, one day will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But we're in a different position than a lot of those people. You and I are in a vastly different position than people who lived even a few hundred years ago. In that we have the Word of God written down, bound together, and proliferated throughout our world in cheap, easy availability. And you can get it for free. All you got to do is ask. And people will be half happy to spend money to purchase you a copy of the Word of God. Now back to your future. Imagine you're standing before the judgment seat of Christ. And the judge, Jesus, looks down at you. And he says, Now you had the inspired Word of God. In fact, you had several copies of it in your house. How many times did you read the whole thing? You are alive this many hundreds of thousands of hours. You are awake this many hundreds of thousands of hours. How many of those hours did you spend reading the inspired Word of God that I put in your hands for free? Let me tell you something. It is not going to be an adequate excuse for you to say, yeah, but I had to watch my shows. Yeah, but there was a football game on. Yeah, but my children were playing softball. It's the most precious thing in your life. It's the most precious possession you've ever been given, physical possession. How do you treat it? How do you look at it? Jesus spent time with it. Jesus spent time with it, and he read it, and he studied it, and he talked about it. And if you're going to be like Jesus, you've got to be in the Word. And when people ask you questions, you need to be able to respond with what the Word says. And sometimes you wonder why it's hard to do the Word of God. Why do I struggle doing what God wants me to do? It's because you don't know what God wants you to do because you haven't been reading it. Because you haven't been studying it. If you're going to be like Jesus, you're going to be in the Word of God. Number three. Number three is meditation. Think about Jesus going away often to the wilderness to pray, the custom of going in to read the Bible. When Satan comes to him in the wilderness and tempts him, he responds with the Word of God. And over and over he's given questions and he responds with the Word of God. In the Sermon on the Mount, when he's correcting misteachings by the Jews, he quotes the Word of God. What has he been doing? He's been taking the Word of God and thinking about its application. Spending time with it in his mind. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. The New American Standard says, Take pains. 
But the King James, which I think is a better translation in this verse, says, meditate on these things. New American Standard says, take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. The word, med the word meditate there comes from the Greek word melatao. Melatao means to revolve in the mind. Okay? To have it in your mind and roll it over and over in your mind. Again and again. You see the difference? The difference in, in meditation... We have this, this wrong connotation with meditation. We think of what we've seen on television with these Eastern gurus sitting there with their palms up humming. And they're trying to empty their mind. That is not what the biblical idea of meditation is. And Psalm 1 talks about this. His delight is in the law of the Lord and in His law He meditates day and night. Meditating in the law of the Lord is to roll it over in your mind and think about it from different angles all the time. And as you do that, and you think about how it applies to you, and what decision the Word of God calls you to make, and what does it mean in this context, and when I've got two different scriptures, and I'm not sure which one to choose, I think about it, and I pray about it, and I roll it over in my mind. I meditate on the Word of God. That's what being like Jesus requires. Go with me to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, Jesus gives us an interesting teaching. Verse 24, He says, When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which it came. So here you've got a man who has an evil spirit. His life is an absolute wreck. He's overcome with evil and a wickedness and an evil spirit. The spirit is cast out. His life is cleaned up. Everything is put in order. All right, well, let me read the next verse. Verse 25, When it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits, more evil in itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. Here's the idea. God can clean up your life. You can come to Christ, get rid of the bad things in your life, have your life put in order, but now you've got to fill your life with godliness. And if you just stay where you were when you came to Christ and when you received deliverance from sin, when you were redeemed, if you don't start to grow and to grow in the graces of the Spirit, the evil's going to come back. And it's going to be worse than it was before. So meditation, according to the New Testament, according to the Bible, is not emptying your mind. It's filling your mind with the Word of God. Study is taking it in. Meditation is thinking about how to use it, how to apply it. That's what's required. It's not enough to just study it. It's not enough to just know it. You've got to have it permeate every thought and every desire. Number four, fasting. Look at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus has just been baptized. And as soon as he's baptized and John sees the Spirit fall on him like a dove, says, Here's the word from heaven, the word of the Father himself, saying, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is then led by the Spirit out into the Judean wilderness. And the Judean wilderness is a bleak, it is a desert place. It is very steep hills, rocks, a little bit of sand, just a little bit of scrub brush, but almost no plant life at all. And Jesus goes out there for 40 days. Matthew chapter 4, verse 2. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Now, we're going to go to Matthew 6 in just a minute. But think about this. 
Jesus is about to face his ultimate temptation, at least before the cross. Okay? He has now made himself known. The Father has now declared him the Son of God in public. Okay? There's no more hiding. Satan now knows who he is and where he is. All right? And Satan's coming. He is coming to get him. And what does Jesus do to prepare for this collision with God's enemy? He fasts. He fasts. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I'm not going to ask you how many of you have ever fasted. But I know from experience that most people in our brotherhood practically or literally never fast. Let me ask you this question. And let me, well, first let me say this. We see a lot of other people fasting. We see especially Daniel, but a lot of other people in the Old Testament, Moses, Elijah, a lot of people fasting. If Jesus needed to fast, why do you not need to fast? If the Son of God, God in the flesh, the Word that became flesh, needed to fast, to face the difficulties of this life. How can you say that you don't need to fast? Look at Matthew 6. Matthew 6, verse 17. This is Jesus talking to people following Him. This is a general, huge crowd of people, not just to the apostles. This is for everybody. Matthew 6, verse 17. But you, when you fast, When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Almost the same thing he said about prayer, right? It's a parallel idea, only instead of prayer, this time it's fasting. Jesus expects that we will fast. And I've had people argue with me about this. People in the church say, well, I think fasting comes naturally. When you're under a great strain, when something terrible is happening, you just don't feel like eating. I don't think that's the way the Bible portrays it. That certainly happens. When you undergo a great stress, a great strain, somebody very sick or somebody dies, sometimes food is the worst idea in the world to you. But this is what we need to do to practice. This is the discipline of Jesus so that we're ready when those difficult trials come. Think about the church. Acts chapter 13, verse 2. It says, While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting. All right? This is the church. Jesus says, He also, they ask Him, Why you don't fast? Why your disciples don't fast? He says, Well, while the bridegroom's here, they don't fast. But when the bridegroom is grown, gone, my disciples will fast. Acts chapter 13 is an example of that. Acts 13 verse 2, While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So in preparation for a great missionary journey, the first missionary journey of Paul, They fasted. They were fasting before that, but then when they got the instruction to do it, they fasted again in preparation for a great, difficult undertaking. Come forward to Acts 14, next chapter. Acts chapter 14, verse 23. This is on that missionary journey. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting. Okay, so let me show it to you. You've got the example of Jesus. He fasted. You've got the instruction of Jesus. When you fast, when the bridegroom is grown, then my disciples will fast. You've got the example of the church. They fasted. Okay, now let me say this. I have done it. I have fasted. 
and it's not easy. But if you do it to lose weight, it's not a good weight loss program. If you do it for a physical, personal purpose, it's not a spiritual task. But if you do it to get closer to God, if you do it in connection with prayer and studying the Word of God, it takes your prayer and studying to a new level. Let me give you a practical example of how it works. You go 18 hours without a single calorie. Now, I recommend doing it with water. And you can do it, you can do different fasts. You can do what's called a, uh, a modified fast so that you don't go off of all food. And some people with blood sugar issues should not do that. It's, it's a terrible idea medically. But you can limit yourself to certain kinds of food. That's what, there's an example of Daniel doing exactly that. But when you do this, when you go 18 hours without a single calorie, you get hungry. And you think, well, I'm going to go get me something to eat. And every time you think I'm going to go get something to eat, then you have to think, no, I've made a commitment to God. And you see, what you're doing is you're putting your commitment to God above your physical needs. And you're saying, I'm going to prioritize the spirit over the flesh. And I'm going to take my fleshly desires, even my natural, normal, healthy desires, and I'm going to put them in subjection to my commitment to God. That's what Jesus did. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of Him who sent me. That's more important than my physical necessities. It's more important even than food and air. And fasting makes that real to you. And it brings your body, your flesh, under the control of your spirit. Because your spirit and your flesh are always in a battle. There's always a fight between the two. And fasting is a method when accompanied with prayer and study and I would say meditation too then it it increases the effectiveness of those other disciplines. Number five simplicity. Luke chapter 9 I want you to think about Jesus here. I want you to think about how he lived his life. Jesus is God in the flesh. John chapter 1, Colossians, Hebrews, they all teach that Jesus was the agent of creation. Jesus created the world. He is the force of creating the world. He is a part of the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? This creator of the world, part of the Godhead, becomes a human being. And when he lived as a human being, he lived a life free from the trappings of wealth. Free from the distractions of earthly possessions. Luke chapter 9 verse 58 Jesus said, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay His head. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay His head. Jesus didn't own a house. He apparently didn't even own a bed. He lived a life focused completely on carrying out the mission of God, His own mission. Now the New Testament does not teach us that we have to live an ascetic lifestyle. It does not teach us that we have to take a vow of poverty and sell all of our possessions and live in, in poverty. But it does teach us to make sure that we never allow earthly possessions to distract us from our spiritual walk with Christ. And that's called simplicity. Removing those distractions from your life, when they become a distraction, that you deprioritize them to the point that you're willing to actually get rid of them. But this requires 
a different analysis. You think about the pearl of great price, and the man, when he had found it, went and sold all that he had so that he could purchase it. You ask yourself this question. Are you willing to give up literally everything you have to be with God? If God asked, would you sell your house and your car and quit your job and sell your jewelry and sell your guns and sell all of the things that you enjoy so that you could be with God? Do you see the kingdom of God and your relationship with God is that much more important than everything else you have? Jesus did. Jesus did, and He lived like that. Mark chapter 4, verse 19 says, The worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. That's in the parable of the sower. You see that? The worries of the world... The deceitfulness of riches chokes the word. Money is a root of all sorts of evil, and many by longing for it have pierced themselves with many a pain. You see, it's a thing that keeps you from being like Jesus. It's a thing that keeps you from disciplining yourself and living the way He lived and adopting the habits that he adopted. Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, verse 8, If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. Not many of us can say that. Not many of us can say, I will be content as long as I have something to eat and something to wear. That's what Paul said. And that's the attitude that God wants us to take. Number six. Service. Go with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, Jesus has just washed the feet of the apostles. They're in the upper room at the Last Supper when he institutes the Lord's Supper before he sends Judas out to betray him. He's within just a few hours, probably just within a couple of hours of being arrested and just within a few hours, maybe 12 hours of his actual crucifixion. And he washes the feet of the disciples because they're arguing about who's the greatest, who's the most important, who should have the highest position in the kingdom. And Jesus gets up and he takes a towel and he ties it around his waist and he takes a bowl of water and he goes from man to man washing their dirty feet. And at the end, Luke chapter 22, verse 27, he says, For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You see, Jesus disciplined himself by serving all the time. All the time, Jesus took the attitude of, I'm going to help other people. And if you want to be like Jesus, if you're going to act like Jesus, if you're going to become like your master, You've got to serve. You've got to be willing to get down on your knees and do that which is dirty and disgusting. You have to be willing to do what nobody else wants to do. You have to be willing to do what everybody else thinks the person who does is unimportant. That's what service is. That's what Jesus was. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Have this attitude also in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see the point. To be like Jesus, to act like Jesus, you have to humble yourself. You have to serve. Finally, number seven, fellowship. Fellowship 
may seem odd to you. But if you look at the life of Jesus, you look at how he structured his life, you look at the way he went through his life, he had an amazing balance. He had this balance where he would often slip away to the wilderness by himself to pray, but he also had the other side where he was often around people. And not only was he often around people, he chose 12 men. Turn with me to Mark chapter 3. It's another one of those verses that seems like just a, just a brief mention, like it doesn't have much importance, like, you know, it's just a little transitional verse, but it's so much more. There is nothing like that really in Scripture, especially in the life of Christ. Mark chapter 3, verse 14, where Jesus is appointing the apostles, it says, He appointed twelve so that they would be with Him. Why did He appoint the apostles? So that they would be with Him. Jesus lived a life of community. He lived a life of relationship with fellow followers of God. And he cultivated those relationships. And he spent time on those relationships. And he invested himself in those relationships. And a lot of people have the mistaken impression that the only important activities of a church is worship. And that's not true. Worship and teaching the Word of God is an extremely important responsibility of the local church. But so is fellowship. And you can't reject either one. John 17, verse 20, Jesus is praying. This is also uh, the night, uh, probably between the upper room and Gethsemane, maybe still in the upper room, but this is often called the high priestly prayer. John 17, verse 20, Jesus said, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. What is he asking for? Verse 21, that they may be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. You see what Jesus is praying for when it comes to the church? He's praying for connectedness. He's praying for relationship. He's praying for intimacy. He's praying for people who are bound together closely in their lives. Bound to Him, bound to the Father, bound to one another. And you see that in the early church. I'm almost through Acts chapter 2, verse 42. After the, day, after the Peter sermon on Pentecost, 3,000 people are converted. Verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. Verse 47, they were continually taking their meals together. Listen to this. They were devoted continually to fellowship. They were taking their meals together. And yet we know there's a meal scheduled for a couple of hours from now here at this congregation. And a lot of people have already made plans to reject that fellowship. A lot of people have the mistaken impression that the fellowship of the church is not important to the life of a Christian. A lot of people have the mistaken impression that's it, that it's okay to have grudges and disagreements fester for years between brothers and sisters in Christ. A lot of people have the mistaken impression that it's okay to isolate themselves from the body of believers outside of worship. It's false. It's not what Jesus did. It's not what Jesus taught. It's not what Jesus prayed for. And it's not what His church did in the first century. They were devoted to fellowship. And if you want to be like Jesus, you've got to be devoted to fellowship. You've got to be devoted to prayer. You've got to be devoted to study. You've got to be devoted to meditation. You've got to be devoted to fasting. You've got to be devoted to simplicity. You've got to be devoted to service. And you've got to be devoted to fellowship. Seven keys to becoming like Christ.
Thank you all for being here this morning. I really look forward to this week. God bless you.